Hello, I'm Karen Romano Young. I'm here with Alice the Giraffe, some sea stars of Alaska, Elliot's flag people, and a girl, a raccoon, and the midnight moon. Written by me, read by me, illustrated by the amazing Jessica Bagley, published by Chronicle Kids in 2020. Chapter 49, Election Day, November 7th. All day election day, when school was closed to host the voting, Pearl stayed at the newsstand in the raccoon costume, handing out the noon raccoon from morning till evening. That night, Mom invited Bruce, Ramon, and Simon over to eat big deli sandwiches, drink beer or root beer, and watch the votes come in. And even though it was a school night, Oleg and Francine were allowed to come too. What's this poster mean? asked Oleg, pointing at the in the night kitchen poster, at the skyline in it, made of bottles and cartons, the fat mustachioed bakers, the naked little boy falling into the milk. It's about how the city never sleeps, said Bruce. Raccoons are awake all night, said Francine knowledgeably. Some people are too, said Ramon, trying to get everything set for the daytime, keeping things safe and making the bread. Or up worrying, said Mom, shaking her head. The circles under her eyes were so dark she could have had raccoon blood herself. But that's not why you love this poster, Pearl. Simon's deep eyes invited her. It's your favorite book. I used to pretend I was in it, said Pearl. The buzzer buzzed. Who else could it be? It's Jonathan Yoikes, came the voice through the intercom. Pearl buzzed him in and opened the door. Yoikes was traveling light. In a hooded sweatshirt with just a camera around his neck, his beaming face as round as the full moon. Did you hear? He asked. It just came over the wire. He held up his cell phone so they could all read the text from his editor. Tomorrow's headline. Beloved New York Library stays open. Hurrah! Giant cheers, clapping, stomping, and the spilling of root beer. Mrs. Library Manager, speech, announced Ramon. My people, began Mom, joking, glancing from one face to the next, and then stopped on Pearl's. Pearl considered the secret Mom had kept to save the library. She didn't exactly shrug it off, but she knew what she had to do. Now, for a little while longer, Pearl would help her mother build and rebuild. Mom pulled herself together. We have people to thank, plans to make, problems to solve. What a story! She started giggling. Where do I even begin? Begin with Vincent, said Pearl. If she wasn't here, the library wouldn't be half as beautiful. Begin with her head being stolen, said Bruce. If that hadn't happened, the library wouldn't have gotten any publicity. He smiled at Mom. Begin with the rock lady, said Oleg. If Francine hadn't come up with that, the kids wouldn't have started coming. Begin with the reading raccoons, said Francine. That's what kept them coming. But now listen, Yoik said to Mom. The construction guys mentioned your staff had an unusual idea for what's next. Have you given it any thought? Have you put it to any discussion? About Mr. Nichols, Mom said, nodding around the room to include them. We approve, said Bruce. It'll work, said Ramon. Pearl's suspicion rose. She hadn't been included in any discussion. If it works out, you'll love it, Pearl. There is just one thing, said Mom. Nobody knows where to find him. I do, said Pearl. It was as she'd expected. The rubber-banded wad of papers in the shed-shaped box were enough to track down Nichols's lawyer, who conveyed the city's offer to Nichols. If he was going to use his credit card, he was going to have a post office box where he could get his bill. And now, Nichols was going to be a consultant to Mr. Bull and Mr. Dozer. That's right. The architect, Christopher Nichols, his name now cleared, was back and hired to consult on the library renovation. Instead of new housing, Mr. Bull and Mr. Dozer had put in a bid to restore the old library. With Mom, Ramon, and Mr. Nick Christopher Nichols, they pored over the plans. Francine and Pearl weaseled in around them. Francine to see how people made things, and Pearl because she thought she owned the place. Mom put a finger on the sketch of the security officer's office that they were building in the basement, along with office space and conference rooms for tutoring. Look, said Mom, 
looking into Pearl's eyes, a bedroom for our new security guard. Like Mike Mulligan living in the basement of the new town hall, said Francine. That's me for a bit, said Nichols, bowing shyly. But he hadn't been too shy to suggest something else for the library basement, a section of lockers where homeless people could keep their belongings safe so they wouldn't have to carry them everywhere they went. And maybe a public bathroom down there too that homeless people would be welcome to use. And the staff agreed. If homeless people were part of their neighborhood, then the neighborhood branch should have services for them too. In the face of this, Pearl couldn't bear to ask where Mary Ann and Eric would live if they ever came back. But what was that noise? Bruce was bellowing Pearl's name from the garden door. She skidded down the hall and stopped short at the door, squeaking her sneakers. At the foot of Vincent's statue was a middle-sized raccoon. Pearl ran into the garden. You got bigger, she said, grinning. Marianne put up a paw in greeting and smiled back. Pearl pulled a card catalog, a catalog card from the stack she always kept in her pocket now because she never knew when an idea for a story might hit her. The raccoon grabbed the card. Couldn't stay away. Too much to write. I get it, said Pearl. You can take a raccoon out of the neighborhood, but you can't take the neighborhood out of the raccoon. Mary Ann shook her head. We need writers in the city and the country. I'm the new editor-in-chief. Grandma will be reporting from the field. She's ready for a change of pace. At first, Pearl just laughed a little. <laughs> Literally from the field, she said. It made her remember. Did you find Eloise? Marianne nodded and cocked her head, asking Pearl a question with her eyes. Pearl didn't ask how, but she could tell. Marianne had somehow gotten the truth out of her cousin about who had stolen Vincent's head. Pearl looked at her feet, at her hands, over her shoulder, anywhere but at Marianne. Then she felt her friend's paw on her toe. Your mom is the future of the library. As for you? Marianne did her raccoon smile, showing her little teeth. Pearl understood. Who knew what she'd do? Maybe she'd be a librarian herself, or maybe she'd write. Or maybe she'd be a professor, professional master of ceremonies with a show of her own. You won't tell anyone who stole the head, she asked the acting editor-in-chief. What a scoop that would be. But the raccoon was her friend first, reporter second, and Marianne shook her head. Thanks, whispered Pearl. I'm glad you're back. And then she thought about what it meant that Marianne would be here alone. I'll be the best co-author I can be, she said, thinking of Marianne having so much work to do, running the midnight moon by herself and friend. Just then, a kit peeked his head out from behind Vincent's feet, smiling with all his teeth showing. Hey, look who, look who showed up, said Pearl. The little raccoon grabbed the pen. He wrote, Eric, I write. Nice job, said Pearl. But where were the raccoons going to live? She ran to her nook and huddled there, considering. She barely looked up when ne Nichols settled beside her. Pearl, he said, I'm the one that showed you those reading raccoons in the first place. Did you really think I wouldn't consider them in the plan? But Mr. Bull and Mr. Dozer are in the city, and what they don't know won't hurt them, said Nichols. They wouldn't believe it anyway. If I told them there was raccoon space built into this plan, and naturally, the renovated basement wouldn't be up to code without a storage closet or two. Mary Ann has to live in a closet, Pearl said, but she felt hopeful. A closet with a back a foot or two short of the wall behind it, with, say, a small door so the plumber can access the heat pipes. See what I mean? She saw. She smiled. A sidebar about friendship. It takes plenty of worms to make a good bit of compost. That's what Grandma says. That's her way of saying, don't expect all your friends to be just like you in every way. Just hope they are in the ways that matter by M.A.M. The very next day, Ramon splayed an open copy of the morning moon across Pearl's lap. There Pearl was, photographed at last, although she was pretty well hidden by the raccoon costume, not to mention upstaged by Mary Ann, standing on the newsstand ledge at her shoulder, Unique New Yorkers, Marianne Malamar and Pearl Moran. In the city that never sleeps, 
One reason New Yorkers are so uniquely nocturnal is doubtless the midnight moon. Not the one in the sky, the one on the newsstand. In a city that's a symphony of language and literature, it's little surprise that the brains behind this deep dark edition is a raccoon with a command of both. Among the Midnight Moon's recent headlines, courtesy of reporter Marianne Malamar, were tales of a cooperative cleanup after a Halloween party as local rodents pitched in to squirrel away leftover pumpkin rind. Newcomer park ranger Bruce Chambers led a Central Park Animal Census, revealing 212 species. And a string report covered a reunion involving a raccoon relocated weeks ago by Have a Heart Trap. Go looking for Marianne Malamar, and chances are slim that you'll find her. What you will find is her spokesperson, Pearl Moran. Pearl is the daughter of the librarian in charge of the Lancaster Avenue Branch Library, recently threatened by the swing of the wrecking ball. The unique New Yorker's reporter caught up with Pearl, dressed in the striped furs of the Moon editor herself, as she notified the neighborhood reading raccoons a brand new city symbol to rival Lady Liberty, or at least Mr. Met, of, of the need to vote for the library's new budget. The fastest growing crowd south of Times Square, Lancaster Avenue's reading raccoons rally around a good story, such as the recent weird overnight reappearance of the stolen head of a beloved statue. Perhaps, our reporter asked Pearl, Marianne Malamar could shed light on this mystery. Pearl said with a shrug, the head is back where it belongs. That's the main thing. As the old saying goes, there is history. There is mystery. It's a local public library. These lines are from a jingle advertising the New York Public Library that played on TV in the 60s. And I'm going to sing it for you. There is history. There is mystery. It's a local public library. In other words, a treasure. You heard it here first, straight from the librarian's child herself. So it is, Pearl told Francine, finishing her story, that Mr. Christopher Nichols comes to live in the library after living with Mr. Gary Gulliver during construction. Gully had to let him, said Francine. He's on the library side after all those baseball cap sales. Sales of the raccoon masked baseball caps had gone through the roof since Yoix's story and all the moon editions about the reading raccoons. It seemed that Lancaster Avenue had somehow gotten popular. This neighborhood was always exceptional, said Mom. Now everyone wanted a hat to show they were part of it. In the spring, Pearl continued, Mr. Nichols will become the man of all work, security guard, building inspector, furnace man, and the consultant for other improvements. Francine interrupted, who lives along with editor, reader, and raccoon Marianne? Pearl finished, in the basement of the new library. What a ridiculous story, said Francine. Marianne at their side, scrawled a hasty note. Do tell. It's not over. There's one more chapter and I'll be back tomorrow to read it. Thanks for listening.